the one thing all believers share in common is our uncommon common faith. I'll explain what I mean as we continue our journey through the scriptures on Untwisting the Gospel. Unity, unity, unity. That is the catchphrase of the day. Everyone's talking about unity. People in the world want to have unity with the church and people of varying denominations want to come together under the banner of unity. Well, if Jesus Christ is not at the center of the belief system of everyone who's calling for unity, there will be no unity because Jesus Christ is our peace. There's only unity in Christ. Therefore, all those who are connected to Christ have an uncommon salvation. It is not the norm. I remember growing up as a boy in church thinking that everyone thought the same thing about Jesus. I went to a Christian school and so everyone around me had a basic understanding of who Jesus is. But then when I went to a secular high school, I learned that, oh, wait a minute, my common faith is uncommon. And so in this world, we must realize that our common faith as believers is very uncommon in the world. This is what uh, Jude, we've been studying Jude, and Jude, he wanted to talk about the unity, our common salvation, but something occurred that caused him to change from doing that 
to another course of action. So let's read it in Jude 1 verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. In this passage, we see three things. First, the called, beloved in God the Father and being kept for Jesus Christ, share a common salvation. And that salvation is Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ alone, who is the way the truth and the life. No one come to the father, but through him that is common among true believers. But as we will see, it is not common among some so-called believers. And it is definitely not common in the world. Also the call beloved in God, the father and kept for Jesus Christ are to contend earnestly or to fight for the faith. And we'll define the faith as this, the doctrine of salvation revealed in scripture. That is so important. It is the doctrine of salvation. Many people, and I've said this before, they say all we need is love. We just let's we need to put aside our differences. We cannot put aside our differences because our differences make the difference of whether we're going to heaven or not, whether we belong to Jesus Christ or not. The goal is not to make the world a better place. Rick Warren and some others believe that, but our goal as Christians is not to make the world a better place. It is to help those whom God has called to get off the sinking Titanic. This is what we are called to do. And thirdly, the called beloved in God, the father and being kept for Jesus Christ, believe the doctrine of salvation once for all handed down to the saints is fixed, sufficient, and complete. Today, our focus will be on the first point, the common salvation of all believers. This is so important. A lot of people say, well, you can't question someone's if whether or not they're a Christian, you, or you shouldn't judge someone. Yes, you can. If someone says something that is totally out of line with what the scripture says, you can question them. If they do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, they are not a Christian. There is a man today who who's on YouTube and he had a lot of he's conservative in his beliefs and a lot of Christians follow him. But he says that Jesus Christ is not God. Now, I can't follow a guy like that. I can't even join hands with someone like that. Why? They're denying the very foundation of our faith. Remember, when you join hands with so-called believers who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, you are doing something worse than hanging out with people in the world. At least the people in the world never claim to know Jesus. Our enemy is not the world. The world is not our enemy. The enemy is are those who are in the church who claim the name of Jesus Christ, but do not believe he is who he says he is, did what he said he would do and can do what he promised he said he would do. That's the enemy. All of salvation pivots around this question. Who do you say Jesus is? And Jesus asked his disciples that question in Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Jesus was asking a very general question about what do people say about me? Who do they say I am? And again, this is so important. There are a lot of people who say, well, they're Christian, they're Christian. You have to first let people define what they believe. For example, people say, I believe in grace. Well, what is their definition of grace? You cannot go by what people say. You have to go by what they mean when they say it. For example, in America, a lot of people say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. But what do they mean? In an article by Benjamin Farrell in Newsweek in August, it says the 2020 survey conducted by Ligonier Ministries found 52% of U.S. adults say they believe Jesus Christ 
is not God. And we claim to be a Christian country. In the same survey, he continues, nearly one third of evangelicals in the survey agreed that Jesus isn't God compared to 65% who said Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. In another article by Jennifer Williams in Vox in December of 2019, the headline reads, Muslims love Jesus too. Six things you didn't know about Jesus in Islam. Muslims don't believe Jesus was the son of God, but they do revere him as a holy prophet. Once when I was ministering in a jail, a Muslim young man came to me and said, all of this doesn't matter. We all serve the same God. And there are a lot of Christians who teach this same nonsense. Yes, I said nonsense. And I call it nonsense because of what I said to the young man. I said, the God I serve has a son who died for my sin. He took on flesh, was crucified. He died for my sin, was buried and rose on the third day for my justification. Your God, Allah, does not have a son. Matter of fact, it's blasphemy to say that Allah has a son. Therefore, if you hear of a Christian spewing this foolishness, do not listen to them. They do not have an understanding of who Jesus is. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Matthew 16, 14, and they said, meaning his disciples. Some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets, just like the Muslim. Then Jesus asked them a more pointed question. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? That's the question. Who do you say Jesus Christ is, is the most important Question. If you believe he is who he is, then you will not believe in the Big Bang Theory because the Bible says that Jesus created all things were created by and through him. It says that he holds all the world in his hand. You won't listen to all this global warming nonsense. Well, uh, of course, the planet changes. Do you know something? People who talk about global warming or climate change never talk about the sun. The number one thing that affects our climate, they don't talk about. God said, see time and harvest. God is in control of all of this. Man cannot thwart the plan of God. If God does not want the world to be destroyed by a flood, it's not going to happen. Matter of fact, he told Noah, he put his rainbow that has been twisted to mean something else to being something totally perverse. God put his rainbow in the sky to remind us that he will never destroy the world again by water. Yet people are saying using climate change as a religion, it is nothing more than the religion of worshiping Mother Earth. In other words, it's another way of saying there is no God. The Big Bang Theory says there is no God. This whole climate change is about there is no God. And also Darwinism, saying that we came from nothing and formed something and that, and that nothing is, that all life is useless. Brothers and sisters, that is diametrically opposed to the word of God. Jesus Christ is the center of all things. All things are revolve around him and he is to be glorified. So do not get caught up in the nonsense of the world that says you got to do this and you got to unite with that. No, we are united around Jesus Christ, not just who he is, but what he said. And if they don't believe it, that's all right. You keep on going. You keep on speaking. We speak because we believe and we believe and we will do what we know is right. And that is to trust the word of God. No matter how much pressure people exert on you, they call you homophobic. They call you this phobic. I'm not afraid of anyone. And anyone who stands on the solid rock of Jesus Christ is not afraid either. People are, you know, if someone says something wrong, people want to preface it. Well, you know, this is just my opinion. It's not my opinion. It's what the word of God says. And if you don't like it, you need to check yourself because if you don't like what the word of God says, then possibly you may not like God. You just may not like God. You can't say you love him if you don't love what he said. In response to Jesus's question, Simon Peter said this in Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Christ, the son of the living God. There it is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He didn't stutter. He didn't stammer. He said it out loud. You know, Peter could say some really crazy stuff, but he got this right. And later on in this very same passage, Jesus told Peter, Satan, get behind me, <laughs> which shows that just because you understand who Jesus is does not mean you will be perfect now. But Jesus applies his, his the righteousness of Christ is applied to you and you will grow in righteousness over time. So understanding who Jesus is does not mean perfection. It means that you've had a change in direction. Let's go on. Verse 17. And Jesus said to them, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who is in heaven again, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who is in heaven, isn't this just what we've been talking about in the book of Jude, the call beloved in God, the father and being kept for Jesus Christ. You cannot approach God unless he calls you. And when he calls you, you're coming not of your own free will. As I always say, not because of your free will, but because of your freed will. You come freely to him. Now, it wasn't because of Peter's intellect or he was better than everybody else that he was able to say this. Jesus told him pointedly, flesh and blood did not give this to you, but my father in heaven. God revealed who he was for his own purpose and by his own will. It was the spirit of God that caused Peter to believe. Verse 18 in Matthew 16 says, I also say to you that you are Peter, meaning a small stone. And upon this rock, which rock? The divine revelation and declaration of the truth about Christ. Upon that rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus said he would build his church upon the rock, not Peter, Peter is not the rock. He's the small rock that cries out, pointing to the greater rock who is Christ. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is, we sing it. This rock is Jesus, God's only son. Be very sure, be very sure. Your ankle holds and grips, Peter. No, the solid rock, Jesus Christ. So we are connected to the rock. He's saying that upon the divine revelation of who Jesus Christ is, he would build his church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Why? Because it's not man that sets it up. It is not man who reveals it. It is by the spirit of of God, that the truth of God is revealed and we stand upon that truth. Now, hold on there. I don't want you to think I'm a heretic and that I'm preaching untruths here about the kingdom of heaven. I'm very aware of Romans 14, 17, which says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Still, our common salvation consists of working, eating and drinking. <laughs> I know you don't understand, but we're going to make this plain in just a moment. You see, when Jesus was teaching, he fed, remember, he fed 5,000. We pick up the account in John 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give to you for on him, the father God has set his seal. In other words, work for the food which endures to eternal life. Well, what in the world does that mean? We're not saved by our works. And the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is not about eating and drinking. Well, let's continue. Verse 28. Therefore, they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Verse 29. Jesus answered them and said to them, 
This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Do you see this? This is the work of God. This passage can be interpreted really in two ways. One, it is the work of God that causes one to believe, which is true. It is by the divine purposes and the divine will and power of God that someone comes to believe. Also, the work of God does not really require work. You're not saved because of your work. You're saved because you believe. So in this sense, the work is to believe, which is not work, which isn't work at all. Let's look at Isaiah 55 verse one. It says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Now you will never see a uh, name and acclaim it preacher point you to that verse. They're going to say, oh, bless God, you need to give a check and write whatever you want on it. That's, a, th th that's nonsense. God does not hold what he has for you hostage because you do not write a big enough check. Again, Isaiah 55, 1, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. In other words, he's saying, believe. He's saying to believe. And when you believe, you receive all of those things. John 6, 51 says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, remember our common salvation has work, eating and drinking. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give you for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, Jesus knew they did not understand what he was talking about. He knew it, but he didn't stop saying it. Matter of fact, he doubled down. Let's look at verse 54. He says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my, my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Again, our common denomination, our, our common salvation consists of working, believing, eating and drinking, eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. That doesn't mean we're cannibals. What it is saying here, what Christ is saying here, above all, the only way to life is to believe in me, to be totally consumed with me, to be totally filled with me. Then you will have life and life more abundantly. Then you will have the peace that is promised. So our common salvation is built upon the work of God, which is to believe and to feed upon Jesus Christ, the word, the word of God. Man shall not live on bread alone, but upon every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the father. John 6, 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Now, that does, does not mean they lost their salvation. They were following him and believed in him in vain for the wrong reason. Again, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Who do you say that I am? And if you understand who I am, you're not going anywhere. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. You have what? Words of eternal life. In other words, is what Jesus said in John 10, 27. My sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Verse 69 of John 6. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is what every believer has in common. And that belief, believing that way, is very uncommon, not only in the world, 
but in the visible church. The visible church is the are the people you see going in and out of the doors and participating in church. But the invisible church consists of those who God has known before the foundation of the world and who will remain until the very end because they are God's sheep and a stranger they will not follow. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father, but through me in this age of inclusion. It amazes me that those who talk about inclusion want to exclude those who believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. They'll accept anything but that they hate our common salvation. I want to encourage you today. Don't worry about people liking you. If the world loves you, then you are of the world. If someone who denies the deity of Jesus Christ, who denies that Jesus Christ is the only way, if they can sit in your church service and enjoy what you have to say, then you're not preaching the gospel. God does not need celebrity endorsements for his world, his word to go forth. All he needs is the preaching of his word. The church is the only organism in the world that declares the truth of Jesus Christ. And they want to shut it down. We live in a cancel culture. You can spout Buddhism, Islam, anything. But the minute you talk about Jesus, ooh, no, you can't do that. But we should not shy away. We should not give an inch. We do not need to find unity with those who are not united with Christ. Again, they are not the enemy. They are the mission field and we are to stand upon the word of God. Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, meaning you are uncommon according to the world standard. But I chose you out of the world because of this. The world hates you. So many times churches want to make uh, the gospel appealing to people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is an offense. It tells people that they cannot save themselves and they stand in need of a savior other than themselves. The world hates that. People in the world think they are, are God. They can do what they want, when they want, how they want, how often as they want. This is a message that makes people mad. And when you speak the truth, people aren't going to like it. That's why we have an uncommon, common salvation. And the commonness of the salvation is this, that Jesus Christ is the only way you stand upon that. It doesn't matter what people think about you. You continue to speak the truth. When you speak against gay marriage, when you speak against homosexuality, people want to say that you hate somebody. We don't hate, but we understand that that way of life leads to the wrath of God. The most loving thing you can do is to speak the truth about God. If the word of God hadn't been spoken to me about my foolishness, if I stayed in my foolishness, I would be lost today. But God in his mercy allowed me to hear the gospel will change this heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And the same for every believer. We could not save ourselves. We were held captive by sin, but Jesus freed us from that. And as a result of that, we understand we have to declare the most loving thing you can do is tell someone that if you continue in this way of life, that you are destined for the wrath of God and brothers and sisters, they're not going to like it. And they're going to be people in churches who do not like it, who persecuted the prophets, religious people. 
It wasn't secular people. It wasn't people in the world. It wasn't the people outside of Israel. It was the people of in Israel, God's people, those who, who were descendants of Abraham. They persecuted the prophets. You do not veer off course trying to change the community, trying to make the people happy. Oh, isn't that a nice church? They clothed me. Isn't that a nice church? They gave us food. That is not what we are called to do. Yes, if an individual wants to give and we're supposed to give, but the purpose of the church is to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're declaring, if you're giving out food, you're giving out clothes, you're doing all these things and are not declaring the gospel, you are not doing things according to the way God wants it to be. Yes, I said it. A lot of people get all excited. Well, we handed out this, we did that. Yeah, but my question is, are they going to hell? Did you tell them the gospel or do, or do you just feel good because you did something? We're not here to feel good because we did something. We're here to glory in Jesus Christ and to proclaim the gospel and along the way we're to do good works. Yes, but our primary goal, our primary call is to call the lost out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3, all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man or servant of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We're called to good works. We are called to help those who are needy. But the call of the church, that is not the primary call of the church. And the more a church gets into that, the less gospel they preach. Mainline churches used to preach Christ and him crucified. Now they preach the social gospel and Jesus Christ is nowhere found in it. The gospel is based upon what the society says is right. That's why you have churches marrying gay couples. That's why you have churches that people going to church who are living together in sin saying, well, I can teach Sunday school. Are you kidding me? And people say, yeah, well, it's all right. No, it is not. God saves us from our sin. That is the message of the gospel. God saves from sin. He told the woman that was caught in adultery, go what? Feed somebody? No, he said, go sin no more. That is the gospel. We forgot about sin. We don't preach sin. We don't. No, no. We want people to like us. We want to make the lights just right in church. We want to make sure everyone's comfortable. You're a sinner. Okay, come sit down here. You want to be comfortable? Oh, we were not going to say anything to offend you because you want you to join. We want you to join one of our small groups. You, want, you know what? That, that is not it. Preach the gospel. And when you do it, people won't like you. Matter of fact, it's possible that a lot of people won't even come and want to listen to you. But we're not called to get numbers. We're called to be faithful to what God has called us to do. And when we do that, when we see him, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we thank you for your word the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We thank you, Lord God, that you have given it to us and that it is complete and that it is sufficient. Oh Lord, help us to stay focused on your word, to preach when preaching is not comfortable, in season and out of season. I pray, Father, for other pastors that, that you would show them the necessity of the gospel, not the social gospel, not any gospel with anything in front of it, but the pure gospel, the message of Jesus Christ for it and it alone saves. We thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us freely, that you hide nothing from us, that you have revealed your plan, your will in your word. May we be people of the word and may our lives reflect it in our good works. Father, may we be compassionate people. May we be those who are a light in this world, but may we never forsake that for our primary call, and that is to, to call and to speak the name of Jesus and to speak the truth, even when it's inconvenient. May we always declare our uncommon, common faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And because we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. Let's pray together. May the words of our mouth 
and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, and the church said, Amen.